In this PowerPoint, we're going to look at one more application of the law of definite proportions and our molar conversions and cover how to determine empirical and molecular formulas from experimental mass data. So the law of definite proportions states that in any sample of a compound, the elements bound together are always present in the same ratio. And in the last PowerPoint, we looked at this ratio in terms of masses and percent composition. In this PowerPoint, we're going to look at it in terms of moles and formulas. So you know that for any particular formula, the subscripts represent the number of atoms of each element within that formula. It turns out that we can just scale that up to also relate number of moles. So for example, for water, in one molecule of water, we have two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen bound together, as indicated by the subscripts in the formula. We can also say that in one mole of water molecules, we have two moles of hydrogen atoms and one mole of oxygen atoms. Now, these numbers are derived ultimately from empirical measurements of the masses of the individual elements within that compound. So in this PowerPoint, we're going to cover how these subscript numbers can actually be derived and how we can get empirical formulas and ultimately molecular formulas. Say that we have an unknown compound that's made up of two elements, element A and element X. In order to figure out the formula for that compound, we need to figure out the ratio of A to X in terms of atoms or moles. That will give us the subscripts that we can use for our empirical formula. So to do this, we go to the laboratory and we make very careful mass measurements of the amount of element A and the amount of element X that we recover when we break the compound apart. And we know that if we have masses of our elements, we can convert this into moles of our elements using the molar mass. And if we have moles of element A and element X, we can figure out the molar ratio between the two, which is the basis for the subscripts that we use in our empirical formula. So let's apply our steps to determine the empirical formula for a compound that contains 0 0.130 grams of nitrogen and 0 0.370 grams of oxygen. So these are empirically determined masses of nitrogen and oxygen. And the first step in figuring out the molar ratio in the empirical formula is to convert the masses to the number of moles for each element. So for nitrogen, we need to cancel out grams of nitrogen. So we're going to use our molar mass. And we put the actual molar mass on the bottom so that grams cancel out. We put the other half of our molar mass equivalents, one mole on top, and we get 0 0.130 times 1 divided by 14.01, and that gives us 0 0.00928 moles of nitrogen. We do the same thing for oxygen, except that this time we use the molar mass of oxygen on the bottom and we get 0 0.0231 moles of oxygen. So the next step is to determine the whole number molar ratio from these values that I can use as subscripts in my empirical formula. To do this, I'm going to divide each of these values by the least of these values. So what that means, when I compare 0 0.00928 to 0 0.0231, just the magnitude of the numbers, I can see that the first number here for moles of nitrogen is actually smaller. And I'm going to divide both of these numbers by that value. So 0 0.00928 moles of nitrogen divided by 0 0.00928 gives me one mole of nitrogen. And for oxygen, 0 0.0231 divided by that number gives me 2.5 moles of oxygen. So these values can be used to figure out the subscripts in my empirical formula.
What they imply is that for every one mole of nitrogen in my compound, I have 2.5 moles of oxygen. Now, these are not whole numbers at this point, but I can get them to a whole number ratio by multiplying both values by the same integer. So I know that I can get 2.5 to a whole number by multiplying it by 2. I just have to make sure that I multiply the subscript on nitrogen by 2 as well. That means that the ratio will actually stay the same, even though the numbers go up to whole numbers. So this becomes N2O5. And that's my final empirical formula, the lowest whole number ratio between nitrogen and oxygen. This last step isn't always necessary. Sometimes you actually do get a whole number ratio after the second step, in which case you just use those values straight as your subscripts in your empirical formula. Here's another variation on this type of problem. Determine the empirical formula given the percent composition of an unknown compound. And for this variation, I actually have a rhyme to help remember the steps. Percent to mass, mass to mole, divide by least, make it whole. So the first step is percent to mass. And what this means is that we have to convert our percent composition values of each element into a mass in units of grams for each of those elements. And probably the easiest way to do this is actually to think of your percents as a ratio out of 100 grams of your compound. So if you have 100 grams of this unknown compound and you know that 40% of that is carbon, well, that means that 40 grams of your compound is actually the element carbon. And 6.71 grams would be hydrogen, and 53.28 grams would be oxygen. So if we just assume that we have 100 grams total of our compound, then we can take our percent composition numbers and just change the percent to a gram for each of the different elements they're associated with. And once we have our masses of each element, we can then follow through with the same steps we did in the last empirical formula determination. We can convert each of these masses to moles by dividing by the molar mass of that particular element. So 40 grams of carbon divided by 12.01 grams of carbon times one mole gives us 3.33 moles of carbon. We do the same thing for hydrogen using its molar mass and we get 6.66 moles. And for oxygen, using the molar mass of oxygen, we get 3.33 moles of oxygen. Now our third step is to divide by least. So this means the same thing it did before. We're going to choose the smallest number out of our number of moles for each element. And we're going to divide each of the moles by that. So the smallest number actually can be defined either in terms of carbon or oxygen because it's the same number, and that's 3.33. So we're going to divide each of these values by 3.33 to get a whole number ratio, hopefully. So 3.33 divided by 3.33 gives me one mole of carbon. 6.66 divided by 3.33 gives me two moles of hydrogen. And for oxygen, again, it's 3.33 divided by the same number, so we get one mole of oxygen. So the last step is to make it whole. And what this means is that if the numbers that we get for each element in terms of their number of moles after dividing by the least are not whole numbers, then we have to raise them to a whole number by figuring out which integer we can multiply all of them by to get them all as whole numbers, our lowest whole number ratio. In this particular example, they already are whole numbers. So we don't have to do anything else. We can just make each of these whole numbers into the subscript in our empirical formula. And this is the final empirical formula for this compound, CH2O. So an empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio of atoms of different elements in a compound, and it's not necessarily the same as the molecular formula, which shows you the actual number of atoms of each element in a compound. There is a definite relationship between the two. The molecular formula for any compound is always a whole number multiple of its empirical formula. Let me show you what I mean. 
The compound benzene has a molecular formula of C6H6. So one molecule of benzene contains six carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms. But this is not the lowest whole number ratio of carbon to hydrogen. We could divide both of those subscripts by six, and we'd end up with an empirical formula of CH, because the lowest whole number ratio is one to one carbon to hydrogen. Again, it's not the same as the actual number of carbon and hydrogen in that formula, but it's the lowest whole number ratio that's represented in an empirical formula. If I wanted to go back from the empirical formula to the molecular formula, I would just have to multiply by a whole number to, that would give me the same subscripts I have in the molecular formula, the actual ratio of carbon to hydrogen. In this case, that would be six. The key to figuring out what your molecular formula is, given an empirical formula, is determining what whole number multiple you need to multiply by. And it turns out if you have one additional piece of information besides the empirical formula, you can figure this out. And that one additional piece of information is an experimentally determined molecular mass. So there are instruments called mass spectrometers that we can use to figure out a molecular mass for a compound, even if we don't know what the formula of that compound is. So mass spectrometers are very nice instruments. They're becoming much more widespread in a lot of different laboratories, and they give you a huge amount of information about unknown compounds. In this case, one of the most important pieces, of course, is that they can tell you what that molecular mass is. And if you know the molecular mass, and you have an empirical formula, you can actually calculate the empirical formula mass. It turns out that the ratio of the molecular mass divided by the empirical formula mass will give you that whole number that you multiply your empirical formula by. So let me show you an example of how this works. Consider a compound whose empirical formula is determined to be CH2O. If a separate analysis using a mass spectrometer determines that the molecular mass of the compound is 180 grams per mole, what is the molecular formula? So I know that molecular formula is simply a multiple of the empirical formula. And what I need to determine is what value I need to multiply by the empirical formula. So I also know that this multiplying factor is simply equal to the ratio of the molecular mass over the empirical formula mass. And I have an experimentally determined molecular mass given to me in the problem, 180 grams per mole. So that's going to be my numerator. For the denominator, I can calculate the empirical formula mass straight from the empirical formula given to me in the problem. So I know I've got one carbon, which has a mass from the periodic table of 12.01. I've got uh, two hydrogens and times their empirical formula mass of 1.008. And I've got one oxygen, which is 16.00 from the periodic table. That gives me an empirical mass of 30.016 grams per mole. So I'm going to plug this into my ratio, 180 divided by 30.016. My units cancel out. I use grams per mole. You could use AMU here as well. They cancel out, so they really don't matter. But 180 divided by 30.016 gives me, well, 5.997, strictly speaking. But that's so close to 6 that we just round to the nearest whole number. And 6 is my multiplying factor. So what I do with this is multiply it by my empirical formula. And it multiplies by each of the subscripts, whether they're assumed to be one or they're actually written as two in this case. And it gives me C6H12O6. That's my molecular formula for this compound. In summary, chemical formulas represent the atom or mole ratio of elements in a compound. Molar conversions can be used to determine the empirical formula of a compound from experimental measurements of the elemental composition and mass. And the molecular formula of a compound can be determined from the empirical formula and an experimentally determined molecular mass.